Amen. Thanks, Yana. Well, again, good morning and welcome. We're glad that everybody's here. And if this is one of your first weeks with us, we're really glad that you're here. Um, we'd love to get to know you, have an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better um, for sure. So stick around afterwards for a time of fellowship. And um, again, we brag every week about the fact that we have good coffee uh, because it's true. Um, but we want to want to have an opportunity to get to know you over a cup of coffee if, uh, if you're up for it. So please stick around. When I was a, a kid, I had one of those little metal, or maybe it was made out of tin, I don't know, but it was, it was just a little metal safe that you could, you know, it had a little coin slot in the top of it that you could drop your change in, or it, you could actually open it. There was a combination lock, and you could, you could open the door. Anybody else have one of those? You could put some of your little keepsakes in it, stuff like that. I see a few hands, people who had those. When, when I was a kid I, and I had one of those, I used to always stuff special things in there. And as I was thinking back about that this week, I can't think of anything that I actually put in it. Like for whatever reason, I remember having the safe and I remember that I put stuff in it, but I have no idea what actually was in it. Anybody else? I mean, we all kind of do that, right? You go on a trip or, or something like that. You pick up a souvenir, a trinket, you know, some, some form of memorabilia. You bring it home, you put it on your shelf, and then it just starts to collect dust. And you honestly, you, you forget that it's even there, right, a lot of times. Or, you know, if it happens to break, it's just kind of like, I don't even remember when I got that, right? And you just throw it away and, and you move on. And it's as if those things that at one point had this, this real deep meaning in our lives, they just become, they become relics in a sense, right? They just, they're not that important anymore. They, they lose all their meaning altogether. And I wonder if prayer has become a relic to us. I wonder if the Lord's prayer has become a relic to us. Like a, like a souvenir, prayer probably conjures up an emotion, probably briefly. Maybe even if it's just boredom, but oftentimes, prayer will conjure up some type of emotion. Maybe many of you right now are feeling guilty because you wish that you spent more time in prayer. I know that I do a lot of times, and I'm a pastor. In one sense, I get paid to pray, right? You'll hear more about my issues and my struggles with prayer as we go this morning. But I think that a lot of times, the Lord's Prayer and prayer in general just becomes to us a meaningless ritual. Does anybody else feel that sometimes? You, you know, you could probably recite the Lord's Prayer. Yana just used it this morning. I didn't even know she was going to do that. Well done. But we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer today. But as she prayed and led us in our time of intercession this morning, she used the Lord's Prayer. Many of you can probably think about times that you've sat through church, or even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard somebody talk about the Lord's Prayer. Or maybe you've, you've heard it recited or you've seen it someplace before. But in essence, it's just become this antique, meaningless relic that collects dust over on the shelf. We've forgotten the significance of it altogether. How many of you sometimes feel like, I feel this way as a pastor, that prayer is like the warm-up before the real business really gets started, right? As a pastor, you feel this when you show up at a meeting or whatever, and they're like, oh, pastor, would you pray for us? And you pray, and then it's like, okay, whew, glad we got that on. Now, now we can get on with the rest of what we really are here for. It's almost as if prayer becomes a garnish right, that's on your plate, but it's not really the meat and potatoes, right? It's not really the feast. That's the way that we treat prayer. And yet I was really convicted when um, some of our missionaries, the Matlacks, actually came this, this past missions conference, and they shared on prayer. And this quote stood out to me from Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers once wrote, prayer does not fit us for greater work. Prayer is the greater work. I treat prayer like that sometimes, though. I need to pray so that I'll be ready to preach. But preaching's the real work. No, the real work is prayer. Prayer is oftentimes treated as an antique relic, right? I mean, think about, we heard this morning, even in Sunday school, Nathaniel was talking about 
the imminent frame, the fact that we feel like a lot of times that, that we live in just a very closed universe and our own efforts are really all that there is. We live in a day and age where technology and medicine and countless other things are things that we rely on, not really prayer. Prayer is just that old thing that people who were uneducated used to do. But now we all know that it's really up to us. And yet, and and think about this. This is a profound reality. Prayer, if if it's not a universal instinct, it's at least a global one, isn't it? People from every corner of the globe pray. They may pray to different gods. They may pray to different things. But it is, in a sense, it is a human reflex to cry out for help. And yet we oftentimes feel like prayer is just not that important. And sometimes in this day and age we ask, well, why why do we pray? And some people would say, well, because it makes us feel better. It's just psychologically helpful. Do you really find that to be true? Sometimes, to be honest, I pray and I feel worse. It's no wonder in one sense. I remember coming across in Colossians chapter 4, Paul talking about one of his friends, Epaphras, praying for the Colossian church. And he uses an interesting word when he describes prayer. He uses the word agonize. Prayers work. It's hard work. Sometimes it borders on agony. So prayer doesn't necessarily make us feel better. It might. But again, sometimes we just feel as if it's meaningless. I remember hearing a story of a man who was with his pastor and he cussed at one point. He said, oh, sorry, this has actually happened to me, though though he didn't exactly, people haven't said this exact phrase. But this man said to his pastor, oh, sorry, pastor, uh, sometimes I get a little worked up and, and, and I cuss, and it just makes me feel better. And I cuss, and you pray a little, but neither one of us really means anything by it. Do we? When we pray, what do we mean by it? Is prayer really attached to the everyday stuff that we experience in life. And and I just want to say, after talking about all of that, that that sometimes we treat prayer as this psychological help or that we just don't need it anymore, can I just remind you that the Bible's perspective on prayer reminds us that it is an earthly thing. It is makes a difference. Have you ever thought about how in the book of Revelation alone, and this is another sermon altogether, but just to prepare our hearts for the reality of what we want to talk about today, have you ever thought about in the book of Revelation, there are these bowls. You remember there's, there are those bowls that are talked about in Revelation, really confusing. Do you remember what's in the bowls? If you go and you look in the book of Revelation, the bowls collect the prayers of God's people. And what ends up happening is those bowls then get turned over and poured out upon the earth. The Bible shows a direct connection between prayer, God reigning in the heavenlies, and an outpouring of God's will upon the earth. That is the biblical picture of prayer. So it's not an antique relic. It's something that we need to get our minds and our hearts around. It is practical, and it needs to be taught. Remember, Jesus' own disciples said, hey, Lord, teach us to pray. And then Jesus gave this prayer that we're going to look at today. The ancient church used the Lord's Prayer. In Acts 2, it says the, the, the followers, the disciples, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of prayer, and to the prayers one of which was the Lord's Prayer. Nine questions in our Shorter Catechism, in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, 
unpacks the significance of the Lord's Prayer. This needs to be taught. But, but again, if I can just remind you of, of our time as we've been moving through slowly through the Gospel of Matthew, I just want to point out something. Get your Bibles out for just a second and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And again, if you're using your phone, that's fine. Keep it out though. But I want to remind you where we are in this situation and show you how practical prayer is, how important I believe it is. When Jesus shows up on the scene and he starts preaching, he starts teaching, he talks about practical things. Jesus is not some ivory tower theologian that is unattached and unconcerned with the realities of what goes on in life. Jesus talks about as what the great, not, the great theologian Nacho Libre would call the nitty-gritty, right? Look, just look at the headings in chapter 5, right? Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount, and then what does he talk about? Well, he talks about anger. Does that apply to your life? He talks about lust. He talks about issues of retaliation and forgiveness. Anybody need to know anything about that. And then when he gets into chapter 6, he talks about prayer. And if you would notice in the Sermon on the Mount, and I, this, I just noticed this week, where does Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer come? In essence, right smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It's not as if Jesus is sitting there as he's walking or going through his sermon saying, let's talk about all this practical stuff, and then he hits pause, and he's like, but now let's talk about this thing that has absolutely no bearing on life at all. Let's just talk about spiritual stuff, so I'll talk about prayer. This is how central prayer is. It's right smack dab in the middle of all of Jesus' teaching in the early chapters of Matthew's gospel account. So Jesus is teaching not about an antique relic. He's teaching about an everyday relationship. Let's read together. For some reason, this is freaking out, by the way. Can I have you advance them back there, Dom? Is that all right? Let's read together, actually, this prayer that we all know so well. Ready? Let's read it together. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or maybe better translated, from the evil one. I actually prefer that translation. But as you see the prayer there, it's set up, I broke it apart like that for a reason. Because it's actually broken apart like that. There's an address, just in an, in an overview, there's one section, an address, our Father in heaven, and then there are two primary sections of petition. The first section revolves around your name, your kingdom, your will. And then the second section revolves around give us, forgive us, and deliver us. Have you ever noticed that before? Wow. Jesus was actually a pretty smart dude, right? He, he, he breaks this prayer up. And so today, as we work our way through it, I want us to think about what we need to learn from the Lord's Prayer about prayer. And the first thing is this. When we pray, we need to orient to the Father. We orient to the Father. Jesus uses this term for God more frequently than anyone else. This wasn't a common description of God back in Jesus' day. There were a few passages in the Old Testament. Thanks, brother. There are a few passages 
in the Old Testament, like in Exodus 4, where God declares that Israel is his firstborn. Or there's the place in 2 Samuel 7 where God gives his promise to David, and he says, your son, the one who's going to sit on my throne, he's going to be my son, and I will be his father. But this is a very rare thing. Jesus calls God Father. Why? Why would he do that? Why would Jesus 15 times, you can go and count, 15 times in the Sermon on the Mount alone, Jesus calls God Father. Why would he do that? Well, probably because he wanted to demonstrate the intimacy that he had with the Father. But I think it's also because he wanted to change our perception of who God is. What is our natural inclination when we start thinking about who God is? What is our perspective on the way that we relate to him? Well, many people today would relate to God as if he is an absent father, if a father at all. He's just gone. He's left us. Other people would Maybe think about God as a police officer or our judge that's, you know, he, he's, he's trailing us, always ready to make sure that as soon as we don't use our blinker in life, if you know what I mean, he can turn on the siren and pull us over. And that's the perception that we have of who God is. And yet Jesus says, pray to him like this. Call him Father. And the New Testament writers, you can go look later. I I actually have a list here, but I won't make you suffer through it. But go and look later. All of the New Testament writers, John, Luke, Paul, Jude, Peter, James, the author of Hebrews, they all follow Jesus' move here. They all call God Father. Do you? And Jesus says, pray like this, our Father. We have the right to claim God as our own. But listen. While Ephesians says that God is the one who has given birth or given life to people everywhere, from every tribe and tongue and nation, and so by virtue of creation, we can all call call God Father. Eternally, those who have the right to call God Father are those who know Him through Christ the Son. Is that the way that you know Him? Do you know the Father through Jesus, the Son? That's the way that you have that right to call him Father. But Jesus says, our Father is the way that we address him. And then he says, who is in heaven? Again, a lot of times when we think about that phrase, there are a lot of misperceptions that we have. Who is in heaven? Oh, that probably means who is just so so far removed from anything real that's going on in life. He's in heaven and we're on earth and never the twain shall meet. That's a poor perception of what it means for God to be in heaven. It doesn't mean that God is removed from everyday life. It doesn't mean, as Bruce Springsteen once said in one of his songs, that God is drifting in heaven while the devil is in your mailbox. God is not disconnected from our experiences. What God being in heaven means, according to Psalm 135 and other places, is that God reigns mercifully, sovereignly, and powerfully over and in all of our experiences. And the fact that He is in heaven means that God can do something about our experiences on earth. See, we have this 
this bifurcation, this divorce between heaven and earth, that's not a biblical concept. This idea of how, we've, we've heard this oftentimes, right, that we live here on earth, this is where real life happens, and God's just up there in heaven, and one of these days, God is going to take us out of here where life happens, and we're going to be with God in heaven. No, read the Bible. The Bible actually says that God is bringing heaven to earth. That's how the story ends, right? He's going to renew all things. And Jesus is here, and what has he begun announcing at this point in Matthew's gospel? That the kingdom of heaven is where? At hand. It's right here. So Jesus brings heaven back. He invades The reality of this life, Jesus is announcing, ushering in heaven invading earth in the person of Jesus. So our Father in heaven sent a delegate, a representative to earth to begin the work of redemption. And now, and I know this is going to shock you, but now the church remains. We are the outpost of heaven on earth. How are we doing? But that is what God has left. He's poured out his spirit upon his church. And Paul says in Ephesians 1 that the church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Really? How desperate we are for God to continue pouring out his spirit upon us. But in order for us to orient ourselves to the Father, we have to get out of the way, don't we? We have to forget our own conceptions and our own, our own conceptions and our own experiences of our own earthly fathers wrongly shade our relationship with God. And I know there are some impossible relationships with earthly dads that are represented in this room. My kids at times probably feel that way. But God the Father never gets it wrong. Oh, how he loves you. And we have to get ourselves out of the way. I love this quote from Flannery O'Connor. When she is praying, she says, Dear God, I cannot love thee the way that I want to. You are the crescent of a moon that I see, and myself is the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon. What I am afraid of, listen to this, dear God, is that my self-shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon and that I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. And so God has sent his son so that we can know him. There is a subjective and an objective reality to this relationship with God as Father, isn't there? Some people, maybe you know some people in your life that they they have an actual real enjoyment of the Father's presence. And sometimes maybe it makes you jealous. There's a subjective reality to it, but listen. Even when you do not subjectively feel close to God, Jesus is here to tell us objectively that he's near. He is our Father. So we orient to the Father, but then we seek his kingdom. Let's work through these three specific requests around the kingdom in this first section really quickly. The first phrase, hallowed be thy name. Who uses the word hallowed on a regular basis these days? What does that even mean, right? I mean, hallowed. It means to make holy, to revere, to set apart. Let me give you an example, and this one will be fitting. Who's the greatest quarterback of all times? See? Somebody said Joe Montana. Somebody said Tom Brady. There are probably other answers, right? God's name is is already holy. It is already set apart. Like to most in this room, Tom Brady, TB12, is set apart. He is the goat, right? And I see, see, there are people who are throwing thumbs down and all that stuff. But what you want, what you want, whoever you choose as your goat quarterback, you want that person's name to be hallowed. 
You want everybody else to recognize your quarterback's name as the name. For me, it's in the area of soccer. Who's the best soccer player of all time? Lionel Messi. I heard somebody say Ronaldo. That is the name that shall not be named. That is blasphemous. Jonathan did it just on purpose, yeah? I knew it was you. We want people's names to be named and recognized, revered, set apart. We do this all the time. And what we're praying for in this first petition is that God's name would be set apart as holy. Not ours. Not anybody else's. Because there's only one name that's going to echo through all of eternity, and it's not going to be mine. It's not going to be yours. It's not going to be Joe Montana's or Tom Brady's or whoever else, Lionel Messi. It's not going to be any of those people. Like Isaiah 26, 8 says, Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your laws, we wait for you for your name and your renown, your reputation, the echo of your praise is the desire of our souls. Is it? After we've oriented ourselves to the Father, we pray that God's name would be revered and that his kingdom would come. That It's a prayer for the steady advancement of Jesus' rule and reign. The kingdom of God, we've already talked about this, but the kingdom of God is the righteous, merciful rule of reign, rule and reign of God established through the person and work of Jesus and applied through the Holy Spirit. And when we pray, God, your kingdom come, let your kingdom come, it, it's, it's us saying, Lord, we want to submit to the fact that Jesus came back to reclaim this world from us who tried to hijack it. You have come back, you have sought to redeem and reclaim that which is rightfully yours. And when we say, Lord, your kingdom come, we are actually saying, God, in this moment, I respond through repentance. Your kingdom come. And I repent. What we're doing is we're praying for more already while we wait for the fullness of the not yet. Lord, send more of your kingdom. And remember too, church, and we'll talk more about this over coming weeks, but when we're praying this, we do not build the kingdom. We can pray for the kingdom. We can seek the kingdom. We can participate in the kingdom, but Jesus builds the kingdom. Jesus brings the kingdom. We participate in it. We respond to it. But it's him that advances the kingdom. Your name be hallowed. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a request that God will cause what pleases him to be done here just as it is already being done in the realm where he reigns in unopposed mercy and righteousness. That's what we're praying for. We're praying that God's desires would be done here, not ours, not the world's, and not the devil's. And this week as I was studying, I was struck by the verb here. It is, let your will be done. Does that sound familiar to you? Any other place in the scripture where repeatedly you hear, let it be, and then something happened? It should remind us of the beginning. It's actually the same word. Let there be light, and it was. Let your will be done, and don't we wait, don't we yearn for the, and it was. That's what we're longing for. That's what we're praying for. We're asking for the fullness of, and life of heaven to embrace the emptiness and the death of earth. But you probably also notice through this that there's a tightening of focus, isn't there? From the greatness of God's name, to the pouring out of his kingdom, to the letting of God's will be done, 
it's in a sense asking for the same thing. It's seeking God's kingdom. We're, we're praying for these things, that God's name would be hallowed, that God's kingdom would come, that his will would be done. But doesn't that all beg a question? If God's name is going to be hallowed, if his kingdom is going to come, if his will is going to be done, by whom? Us. This is a new covenant prayer. It's a prayer of the new covenant people because God says in Ezekiel 36, 27, I will put my law within them and I will move them to obey my will. Lord, let it be. Let it be. So we seek the kingdom and then finally, we bring our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. That's attached to the wilderness wanderings of the Old Testament, isn't it? When God provided the manna, and we heard this morning in Sunday school about the fact that in our day and age, we don't oftentimes think that we need God's daily provision. And yet there are probably some of us in this room that do. Maybe you are wondering where your next grocery bill is going to be paid from, how you're going to scrape together enough money for this month's rent, buy clothes for your kids, get a new job. I don't know. You have daily needs, and God tells us that when we orient ourselves to the Father, when we seek after his kingdom, we also bring our needs. And when we remind ourselves that this is our situation, that daily we have need of God, both literally and figuratively or spiritually, that begins to change our perspective. We all have daily needs from God. Every single one of us are desperate for God's constant care. With the very breath that we use at times to curse one another or even God himself, God provides that breath. We're desperate for his daily care. And when we pray this prayer, when we pray our daily needs, when we bring them before the Father, what should that do? How should that change our lives? Doesn't that change our perspective? Because now we come to realize that we actually are just stewards of anything that God has given us. And shouldn't it actually create more of a heart of generosity in us as God's people that he would even be willing to meet our daily needs through one another? That was the picture in the early church in the book of Acts, right? So we pray, give us this day our daily bread, and then we pray, God, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And have you ever noticed how that phrase is attached Give us this day our daily bread with the word and. We need daily prayer for forgiveness and help to forgive too. We're desperate for this. More than likely this debtor language, forgive us our debts, and that's literally the word there, comes from the Old Testament conception of the year of Jubilee. You remember that? That in the seventh year, all debts were to be forgiven. People think that that's where this idea comes from. But forgiveness and asking God to forgive us of our debts is a hard thing in this day and age, isn't it? Because we actually don't believe that we're debtors. In this day and age, we talked about this in Sunday school today too. Our conception is that we really don't do anything wrong. It's just that someone may do something different than I do. Sin isn't really a debt. It's it's like a caloric experience. If you go to a, a restaurant, you see that a dessert is sinfully delicious. And it makes you want it all the more. And yet, we all walk around with this overwhelming sense of guilt, don't we? In this day and age, we feel weighed down, but we can't explain why. Franz Kafka once said that we are in this day people who are sinful and yet independent of guilt. What he means by that is we know that we actually are sinful. We do right and wrong, but we have nowhere to go with our guilt. 
we think that God really should have nothing against us. And yet, in our own relationships with other people, we know that there's right and wrong, don't we? Because we've been wronged by them. But if there is no right and wrong, what does it matter what someone else does to you? There's no debt. No offense, but get over it. Unless there is God, unless there is right and wrong, then we have to look to Him for forgiveness. And that word forgiveness, the Hebrew word there is the word translated to bear or to carry. There is a weight to debt. There's a weight to sin. There's a weight to wrongdoing. And we need God to bear the weight of our sin, and He has. But we are also called to forgive. Forgiveness is the heart of what Jesus is about. It's the heart of who He is. It's what He came to do, and He calls us to forgive. Now, Understand, and we'll get here when we get to Matthew 18, there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. There's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean that reconciliation has taken place. Forgiveness is a unilateral thing. We do that before God, even to someone else. Reconciliation requires two parties. More on that later. But forgiveness is real. Forgiveness is every day. And that's what prayer is about. And then we pray, lead me not, O God, into temptation. And deliver me from the evil one. The word temptation here carries two different meanings. Depending on who the subject is. And what the intention is. God does not tempt. James says that. James 1, 13 to 15. But God does test. God tests hearts, Proverbs 17, 3. God, he, he tests us to prove our faith as genuine. Satan tempts us to make us fail. And so we pray, God, lead me not into temptation and deliver me from the evil one. Pray, God, that you would keep me from temptation but that I would endure them because I am going to experience them. Matthew 4 and Jesus' own experience should prove that. We will be tempted. And yet God, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, will provide a way of escape. But oftentimes the way of escape through a temptation is through a test. And yet God provides a way of escape. This is so down to earth, this prayer stuff. Jesus is teaching right after he teaches about prayer, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, he goes in to talk about issues of money, provision, anxiety. Huh. I wonder what he could be implying that prayer sits right here in the middle. This is what he's saying. Prayer is not an antique relic. It's an everyday experience. It's an everyday relationship. And God is challenging me in prayer. Prayer is hard for me. I like to study. I like to read. That's easy for me. But I'm finding more and more just my desperate need to pray. Apart from Him, I can do nothing, Jesus says. And so what is next for you in this area? And don't overreach. Don't overreach. I'm going to spend an hour every day in prayer. Don't overreach. What's next for you in this area? Maybe one practical thing you could do on your way out, grab this little prayer guide and commit to use it one day a week. Maybe your next thing is to memorize the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe your next thing is just to pray for two minutes a day. I have no idea. What is your next step in this area of prayer? Maybe you want to join us on Sundays for missions prayer. There's going to be an announcement in a couple weeks about praying every Sunday morning. 
if you're able. Maybe you want to come once a month, once every two months. I don't know. What's your next step? But prayer is not an antique relic. It's an everyday relationship. Lord Jesus, we come before you as your people desperate for you to do these things that we have heard about today. God, we admit our need. Lord, we confess to you that oftentimes we've had our own thoughts about what prayer is and we have neglected it. And yet, Father, there is an ache within all of us to be before you. Jesus, thank you for giving us access to our Father. Jesus, thank you for the forgiveness that you offer to us. Would you bring your kingdom in its fullness? Would you cause your will to be done in us and through us? Lord Jesus, meet our daily needs. You see them. Would you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing? Oh God, we praise you for giving us this opportunity to be before you. In Jesus' name, amen.